to you. Oh, sure. You are now the host. All right. Neil is, uh, I don't know what you are. <laughs> you can join the club on that one. I am about to graduate as a PhD student. Actually, next week I'm defending my thesis, which is where everybody quizzes you to make sure you learn something in, in your four to five year PhD. And so assuming I pass that next Friday, uh, I'll be a doctor in plant breeding. Outstanding. Neil wrote a grant that, that will benefit the association. Uh, well, I'll let him tell you about it. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I managed to tune into some of Craig's talk. That was fascinating here, uh, hearing the geologic perspective. Um, somebody who's referring to the Appalachian Mountains as pretty young is, is different from people who study plants where it's as old as we can as we can find but um anyways uh i am working on a phd program primarily studying plant breeding at the university of wisconsin uh and i'm wrapping it up and i've moved to the northeast region i'm calling in from massachusetts um and so to try to study some of apply some of my phd research here in the northeast i reached out to the association, which has been rewarding so far, and put together a quick grant to submit to SARE in order to fund a couple on-farm trials. This is the rather lengthy name of our, our grant, and it's focusing on renovating sort of switchgrass and big blue stem swords. And oh, there we are. And the inspiration for this is multifold. Um, Current issue with warm season grasses is they're kind of expensive and slow to establish, which is tricky and why testing new varieties will be difficult at a farm scale. Um, there has been pressure, uh, disease pressure that's been reported in some switchgrass varieties, which is reasonable if they've been growing for more than five or 10 years. So studying that and also yield could be improved, which is the big push of some of the work of my advisor, Mike Kassler here in Wisconsin and some of my work. So to give a quick background of germplasm or switchgrass from a breeder's perspective and how we can make new varieties, there's effectively two major pools of genetics in the United States, which we can pull from. There's the upland ecotypes from the North and there's lowland ecotypes from the South. And if you've encountered the Liberty cultivar, that's actually a blend where they cross upland and lowland ecotypes, um, which is interesting because they, as you'll find out later, they differ in flower time by about a month. So getting them to cross pollinate is tricky on its own. Um, but they each have their advantages, primarily uplands, as you can, I covered up with my arrow, in your region, uplands are more suggested. Um, and the very popular variety cave and rock, which I know is, is predominant among switchgrass, is an upland variety. It was collected from Western Kentucky. Um, so from a breeder's perspective though, the most of the diversity in the switchgrass pop uh, species occurs in the Southern United States. There's tenfold more diversity down here to select from. So that's one particular inspiration for studying them more. And another big advantage of these lowland ecotypes that aren't really planted in the north very much is they're very late flowering. And this has been seen in lots of different plant species. If you can push back flowering or stop it entirely, a plant just continues to grow vegetative material, which is faster than growing reproductive material. So this is kind of a very general growth curve, what you might have expect out of a lowland switchgrass plant where it grows little by little all the way across the growing season and levels off in the fall because they're very late flowering. If I were to overlay a growth curve for something like cave and rock, they do phenomenally well in the beginning of the growing season. They'll outpace lowlands in the first couple months. But as soon as they hit about late July is when most uplands flower, their growth stops 
right here. And you pretty much don't get more biomass towards the end of the season. Um, and that just seems to be baked in because they're adapted to northern conditions where that's more adapted. Um, so the question is, can we use lowlands and get more out of our growing seasons, more vegetative biomass, and more above ground material? This is an example of sort of the potential of this maneuver. So this is a grain sorghum compared to a forage sorghum. Some of you might have encountered this. There's also corn that they've done this to where you can, the fancy term is you can make it day length and sensitive. So corn or sorghum never hits the physiological trigger that makes it start to produce grain. This is obviously really bad for the plant. It's, it's an evolutionary dead end in a region where it's not going to actually produce any offspring. But for producing biomass, it's phenomenal. These are essentially the same yield potential. It's just that we disabled flowering time or a breeder disabled flowering time in this forage sorghum and it got three times taller. This is an example of what this looks like in switchgrass. This is an upland on the left in about late July when it's flowering. And this upland is done putting on new growth for the year. Um, the lowland, however, if you can see, there's not even seed heads emerged from the, the leaf material, which means it hasn't even started producing a seed head. So it's very far from flowering and potentially is going to put on even more biomass. And you can see, given the flowers of the uplands, they're about the same in height here. So ideally, there's a lot more biomass potential in these lowlands. Now, I mentioned earlier, there's also been switchgrass diseases reported, and these have been understudied among academics. There's maybe one or two projects and publications that have been worked on for, for all of these, mostly just characterizing that they exist and when they're bad, they can really hurt yield. Um, and that they appear to hit harder in the Northeast or wet regions than, um, than the West, like Nebraska and to an extent Wisconsin. The good pattern that's been observed in all of the studies on these is when they test them, lowlands tend to be more disease resistant. And that goes for all four of these diseases, which are kind of the major diseases that have been studied. And this kind of makes sense. The South, to generalize, the Southern US, to generalize, is a wet, damp, humid place that you would expect a lot of funguses and diseases to hit your plants harder. So it could be that being from the Southern US gives some advantage um, in, in terms of disease resistance, which is great. And another reason to look at lowlands. Now, the reason lowlands have never been suggested in the past up here is winter kill, is what you would expect if you took a grass from the Southern Louisiana Bayou and planted it in Pennsylvania, it's gonna have some trouble over winter. We've often, we've attempted this, we being mostly my advisor, but um, in Wisconsin, we've transplanted lots of lowland populations into the Northern United States and tested them as far North as Northern Wisconsin. So really harsh winters. And in the first couple seasons, you get 90% mortality, 98% mortality. There's populations where we'll record like one out of a thousand individuals survive. And this is what it looks like in the spring. This is a test plot of a population of lowlands. And as you can see, the winter tolerant plots all adjacent to it look phenomenal. This is maybe mid-June, early June, just after green up. But within these plots, you can find survivors. So what we've been doing is we've been taking the best of our survivors, crossing them to each other to make new populations, and we repeat. And so you might see 90% mortality year one, you'll see 50% mortality the next generation, and you can keep uh, killing, like trying to winnow out the winter insensitive individuals out of a population. And this has actually been completed on 10 different lowland populations, which are all very divergent from each other, but tend to be late flowering. Now, the exciting work is my advisor is planning on releasing one of these. It's an improved version of Canlo that has really high winter survivorship as far north as northern Wisconsin. Um, and it seems to have really high yield potential. The bad news is even Cedar Creek, this released, soon to be released cultivar, hasn't really been evaluated at a commercial scale 
and it hasn't been evaluated outside of Wisconsin and Illinois and a little of Minnesota. So evaluating them here in Pennsylvania or the Northeast region would be really valuable. So here we are. So this gets to the study I wanna propose. I have proposed to SARE. Um, we haven't heard back to my knowledge or they haven't made a decision yet if they're going to fund it or not. I'd be willing to do a try a stripped down version of this study if farmers are still interested, even if we don't get funding, or we can try to look for funding from, from other sources. So the main goal of the study is to evaluate primarily new lowlands, although there's other breeding programs that have been operating outside of Wisconsin that have also released some interesting varieties that would be really nice to compare side by side. Um, so for example, this one has actually been available for a while. Timber is a lowland cultivar that was released out of New Jersey, so it should actually be locally adapted to the Northeast. So it's a good comparison. Um, Independence is, I believe, on its way to being commercially released. It's another lowland selected for winter survivorship out of the University of Illinois by a researcher named D.K. Lee. Cedar Creek, as I just mentioned, is this improved Canlo variety. And then there's two big blue stems, one that have been selected for late flowering, essentially trying to take advantage of the same pathway and push flowering back to improve biomass. And then there's two varieties, a switchgrass and a big blue stem that have been selected by RC, stands for REAP Canada. Uh, Roger Sampson, who I believe presented last year or the year before, so you might be aware of his work. And he's intensively been measuring uh, spring vigor in, or measuring and selecting for improving spring vigor in a couple different upland cultivars. I'm gonna compare it, I'm gonna use in this study Big Rock, which is a, an improved version of Cave and Rock, which is really exciting. And then he's also started on Big Blue Stem. So it will be nice to, to look at how this improved Big Blue Stem compares to the variety that Dr. Kassler my advisor in Wisconsin is on his way to releasing. This should also be available commercially. I haven't heard an update on the schedule. The commercial releases from public programs always take longer than planned. So the logistics, I'm going to plant at four pounds per live seed per acre. That's actually for switchgrass. It's gonna be slightly higher for big blue stem. We wanna plant at three different farms. And within each farm, we're gonna do plots that are three feet, 30 feet by 120 feet with two replicates of each cultivar. So we can get a measure of how much variation there is in a field. Um, and so this isn't quite commercial scale, but this is definitely large enough that we should feel pretty confident on which populations can do well and the drawbacks and benefits of them. And I'm gonna measure success based on fall height, fall biomass, and I'm also going to measure seedling survival, which will be interesting to see how those Reap Canada early vigor plants survive compared to the, the fairly unselected uh, spring vigor state of a lot of the other cultivars. And so if you're curious what my predictions are on what might happen in this study, if it is funded by SARE, um, I have no idea what's gonna happen. So a lot of prior studies have shown that there's a lot of yield potential in these lowland cultivars. This is a winter tolerant lowland family. This is a little figure, it shows flowering time. So you can see how we have later flowering time on the left, earlier flowering time on the right, and then biomass potential essentially. This number doesn't translate to tons per acre easily. Um, I wouldn't feel confident, but it's a relative scale. And you can see how the uplands um, flower early and are in the five to six range. These hybrids are Liberty. We use a different term internally, but they're descendants from the Liberty cultivar, a blend between upland and lowland, and they're middle of the road, quite a bit of variation. But the lowlands population here was just phenomenal in this evaluation and it essentially outcompeted all the others and this was just selecting for winter survivorship we didn't try to improve any other biomass traits really so this 
frankly, from a breeding perspective, we didn't even put much effort into this population. Uh, so we should expect slightly better out of something like Cedar Creek that has been bred for more generations. Now, the worst thing that could happen is I'd like to remind everyone again that these populations have never been evaluated at a commercial scale. And it's kind of a um, Murphy's Law situation where there's all sorts of things that could go wrong that we don't see coming. This is a picture of winter kill. So this individual on the right, barely surviving, individual on the left apparently was win more winter tolerant. So you, we could continue to see winter kill for some new reason in Pennsylvania that doesn't exist in Wisconsin, which could be disease, it could be uh, not as a harsh of a winter so that the plant's dormancy gets messed up. There can be a lot of, um, we're planning for unexpected events, or I've learned to assume them. Um, so that's the end of my basic presentation right now. I'd like to thank the, the people who at least helped me put this proposal together and hopefully we'll have some success and continue working together. Uh, Will Wes Ramsey, who helped uh, essentially is the spearhead for a lot of the logistics on this proposal. And then Calvin Ernst, uh, Michael Kassler out of University of Wisconsin and DK Lee all have offered to provide the, the seed for these populations, which is exciting because some of them essentially aren't available commercially yet, but will be in the future. So this will provide really good information for members of the association on under what conditions they, they produce or, or don't produce. Um, and so, as I said, that's the end of my presentation. I have one more small spiel, but I'd love to open to any questions and suggestions, frankly, because I've, if this gets funded, there's a lot of other questions and, and ideas that I feel like we could integrate or use. So thank you for your time so far. Any questions? Oh, come on. Nothing? Just a comment, Will. Yes. Um, Neil, this is Wes Ramsey speaking. Oh, hi there. Uh, great to see you on screen, at least. Uh, yeah. A lot of contact via email and phone. Uh, Sorry, you couldn't make it in person. I was hoping, but uh, hard to pull off. No problem. Uh, just wanted to give you a brief update that I'm expecting, I guess, to uh, hear from Sarah probably in uh, by August or September at the latest, I would think. Okay. Yeah, I saw online sometime in July was kind of their official statement. So, uh, Hopefully sooner, because um, I have to do some prep work if, if it's funded versus not. Right, very good. Uh, well, hopefully that happens, but I'm, I'm uh, used to the bureaucracy a little slower. <laughs> Neil, if, if we don't get funding, in any case, we would go ahead with the trial anyway. Yeah, I I would have to look back at it and possibly figure out how to uh, trim some of the fat off the project. Frankly, um, remove some components because if I I rely on some of that funding for um, even some basic materials and supplies and things, but I would love to do some small version of this. Uh, no matter what, because truly there's a lot of fascinating new cultivars. I suggested six here, but that, but given the opportunity, I could name another six promising populations, um, all of which that have been primarily evaluated in the Midwest. And there's some continued work out of New Jersey on sort of Northeastern adapted varieties, which would be fun to join with them. But there's a lot of potential new varieties to evaluate and see how they perform at a commercial scale. Um, so I'd love to continue to do something like this, no matter what. Okay. Anything else, folks? Neil, thank you. Good All luck. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Be in touch as soon as we hear anything. Okay.